In the evening of August the 11th, 1966, a man is found floating on a small rubber raft off the coast of Brest, France, dressed in a pilot's flight suit and a helmet. On being fished from the water, the man, dazed and nearly incoherent, identifies himself as Joseph Papp, a Hungarian inventor living in Canada. Asked if he was in a plane crash, he says, no, he bailed out of a submarine. What submarine? Where are your crewmates? The rescuers ask. None, says Papp. I was alone. Then Pat makes a truly astonishing claim that he has just crossed the Atlantic in 13 hours, piloting a home-built 300 mile per hour jet-powered submarine. Thus began one of the strangest seafaring stories in Canadian history. Little is known about the early life of Joseph Papp. Born in 1933 in Tatabanya, Hungary, in his teens, Papp trained as a pilot for the Hungarian Air Force before studying mechanical engineering and landing a position at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in Budapest. Following the crushing of the 1956 revolution by Soviet forces, Papp fled Hungary for Canada, settling near Montreal, where he married fellow Hungarian immigrant Helen Maxko. Prior to leaving Hungary, Papp had sketched out a concept for a new kind of jet engine, along with a high-speed submarine for it to power, an invention that would consume the next nine years of his life. Papp's submarine took the form of a long cone, 30 feet long, with a cylindrical engine compartment in the rear and a small one-man cockpit just forward of the engine intakes. Outside visibility was provided by a small periscope mounted in the dorsal fin. Hydrodynamically, the vehicle was sound, working on the principle of supercavitation. Cavitation is a phenomenon whereby the local pressure in a liquid, such as on the surface of a spinning propeller, drops sufficiently for the water to vaporize, forming small bubbles. These bubbles then immediately collapse, thus creating a powerful water hammer effect that can gradually destroy propellers and other high-speed machinery. In a supercavitating vehicle, the motion of the vehicle through the water causes a large bubble of water vapor to form around the hull, separating it from the water and greatly reducing drag. Stability and control are achieved via small fins that protrude through the bubble into the surrounding water. In the late 1970s, the principle was applied by Russian engineers in the design of the VA-111 Shukval rocket-powered torpedo, which, thanks to supercavitation, can travel at speeds of up to 230 miles per hour, nearly three times as fast as the fastest NATO torpedo, the Royal Navy Spearfish. Papp estimated his submarine would be able to reach 300 miles per hour, six times faster than the Soviet Alpha-class submarine, the fastest on record. Papp built his submarine in a friend's garage under the strictest of secrecy. Infamously paranoid, Papp kept the workshop under lock and key and covered key engine components in plaster and papier-mâché between work sessions to hide them from prying eyes. Construction proceeded until 1966, when Papp finally wheeled out his creation before local reporters. Not long after, on August the 10th, Helen Papp phoned the police to report that both her husband and his submarine had gone missing. According to Papp's account, he launched the submarine near Montreal and piloted it down the St. Lawrence into the Atlantic, which he then crossed in only 13 hours. But upon reaching the French coast, Papp encountered stability issues and the submarine nosedived towards the ocean floor, forcing him to bail out. While Papp's rescue caused a sensation on both sides of the Atlantic, his incredible story soon began to be questioned. While the hydrodynamics of Papp's submarine are plausible, the engine that supposedly gave it its tremendous speed was another matter. Papp was stubbornly unwilling to divulge the principle of its operation, only vaguely explaining that it employed a novel atomic principle he had discovered and required only a very small charge of specially formulated fuel. On top of this, despite an extensive search by the French Navy, no trace of the submarine was ever found. Most damning of all, however, was the fact that a man fitting Papp's description and bearing his passport had been seen boarding a flight from Montreal to Paris the night before the alleged journey, and that train tickets from Paris to Brest were found in Papp's pockets upon his rescue. In 1967, Papp attempted to vindicate himself by publishing an account of his exploits called The Fastest Submarine, but this too contained a few details on the operating principle of the engine. Even more embarrassingly, photos in the book alleged depicting the cockpit and engine of the submarine are clearly the interior of a household washer and dryer. Finally, in a 1968 interview with the London Daily Mirror, Papp admitted that the whole affair had been a stunt, carried out because he couldn't bear to admit that the submarine engine didn't work. While the submarine affair was quickly forgotten, it was not the end of the Joseph Papp saga. In 1968, he, Helen, and their daughter Susan moved to California, where Papp began working on his newest invention, a revolutionary new automobile engine that could run for months on a single sealed charge of fuel. The three US patents awarded to Papp describe the engine as running on a mixture of noble gases such as helium, argon, and xenon, as well as small amounts of chlorine and thorium. However, the descriptions in these patents reveal a poor grasp of elementary physics 
physics and fail completely to reveal the operating principle of the engine. Nonetheless, Papp's experiments attracted considerable interest among engineers and investors, and in October 1968, he agreed to hold a public demonstration in the Mojave Desert using a makeshift cannon made from steel pipe embedded in a block of concrete to showcase the power of his special noble gas fuel mixture. Unfortunately, the projectile jammed halfway down the barrel, causing the cannon to blow itself apart. The observers were nonetheless impressed owing to the size of the explosion given such a small amount of gaseous fuel. One month later, Papp arranged for a full demonstration of his prototype engine in the parking lot of a refrigeration company in Los Angeles. Among those present was none other than physicist Richard Feynman from Caltech, who had been given a magazine article about the engine by one of his students. Feynman stated to this, The article talked about a marvelous new engine which works on a new principle for getting power, and it's really quite remarkable. You don't have to buy fuel for the car, the fuel is injected into the cylinders when the engine is manufactured and lasts about six months. Then you have to bring it back to have it recharged. The engine is air-cooled and can make a car run 60 miles per hour on the freeway. I told them nothing has enough power to go for six months like that unless it's a nuclear reactor, which it surely is not. Fakes are always coming out, I said and the guy's probably trying to get investors to invest in his engine. Arriving at the demonstration, Feynman was predictably unimpressed by what he saw, stating, Mr. Pab talked about how the motor works using various and complicated phrases about radiation, atoms, different levels of energy, quanta, and this and that, all of which made no sense whatsoever and would never work. But the rest of what he said was important, for every fraud has to have the right characteristics. Mr. Pab explained that he had tried to sell his engine to the big automobile companies, but they wouldn't buy it because they were afraid it would put all the big oil companies out of business. There were quite a few wires running from the engine, down to where Mr. Papp and the spectators were standing, into a set of instruments used for measurements. The instruments were, in turn, connected by a cord to an electrical outlet in the side of the building. So it was pretty obvious where the power supply was. The engine started to go around, and there was a bit of disappointment. The propeller of the fan went around quietly, without the noise of an ordinary engine, with powerful explosions in the cylinders. Naturally, after seeing all this, Feynman set out to debunk what was clearly a classic perpetual motion scam. In an article written for Laser, the Journal of Southern Californian Skeptics, he described what happened next. Mr. Pab pulled the plug from the wall, and the fan propeller continued to turn. You see, this cord has nothing to do with the engine. It's only supplying power to the instruments, he said. Well, that was easy. He's got a storage battery inside the engine. Do you mind if I hold the plug? I asked. Not at all, replied Mr. Papp, and he handed it to me. It wasn't very long before he asked me to give back the plug. I'd like to hold it a little longer, I said, figuring that if I stalled around enough, the damn thing would stop. Pretty soon, Mr. Papp was frantic, so I gave back the plug, and he plugged it back into the wall. A few moments later, there was a big explosion. A cone of silvery uniform shot out and turned to smoke. The ruined engine fell over on its side. The man standing next to me said, I've been hit. I looked at him. The whole side of his arm was torn open. You could see all the muscle fibers, tendons, everything. By the time the paramedics came, we realized that there were three men injured, one with a hole in his chest, and he ultimately died. Following the incident, Papp sued Feynman for destroying his engine, but since proving this accusation would have required Papp to reveal his engine's secrets, the case was settled out of court, Caltech paying Papp from a legal fund reserved for defending faculty. In his article for Laser, Feynman concludes that Papp had engineered the explosion to prevent closer scrutiny of his engine and keep investor dollars flowing, but had underestimated the explosive charge. Despite this setback and Feynman's damning appraisal, however, Papp continued to work obsessively on his engine until his death from lung cancer in 1989, the alleged secrets of his inventions continuing to generate interest in free energy and perpetual motion circles to this day. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.